This meeting is being recorded. Okay, Krista, it looks as if everybody's in now, I think. Great. All right, welcome everybody. This is our second Faculty of Science Indigenous uh, Science Speaker Series. Um, so welcome, and um, my name is Brian Mark. I'm the Dean of Science here uh, at the University of Manitoba. And before we begin today's lecture, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward and partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So um, I'm, I'm really um, intrigued by this speaker series. Um, the committee that was struck, I would like to thank them again for putting together a fantastic speaker series. Dr. Merle Ballard, who's with us here today, and I'll pass over the introductions to her in a moment, but uh, Dr. Ballard, Dr. Miguel Yurgawa, Dr. Az uh, Klimiuk, Dr. Joey Lussier, and Dr. Uta Koth uh, have been working hard to put this series together. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, Wilfred Buck today and all the other speakers that are lined up uh, to speak after him. And uh, at this point, I'll pass it over to Merle, who will introduce today's speaker. Merle is a, an assistant professor and an indigenous scholar in, the, in our Department of Chemistry at the University of Manitoba. She was also recently appointed as the Director of Indigenous Science for Environment and Climate Change Canada. So Merle, once again, I'm very happy that you're here today. Uh, I know you have a very busy schedule, but it's, uh, but, uh, it's great to have you and, and I'll pass it over to you for introductions. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm really excited about this series. I've always wanted a series like this and we finally have one and uh, we had our, our speaker last month in April. At this time, I want to introduce Wilfred Buck, who is our second speaker. Uh, Wilfred Buck is an in, in new Cree uh, from a past Cree nation. He's an indigenous astronomer. He's a consultant, author, educator, addictions consultant, a cultural consultant, Consultant, education consultant, Sundance chief, knowledge keeper, lecturer, father, husband, portable planetarium owner and operator. Uh, Wilfred, Wilfred originate, originates from a Pasqua Cree nation and is a graduate of the University of Manitoba with, uh, with a two degrees in education. He has 25 years experience as an educator, as well as being a science facilitator at at Manitoba First Nation Education Resource Center uh, for 15 years. And he retired from that position on April, sorry, December 31st, 2020. Sorry about that. I have April in mind. Uh, uh, without uh, further ado, please welcome Wilfred Buck. Wilfred? All right. Thank you, Merle. Tanche and two tell now. Well for Buck the teaching garden and Pasca Ninoche. Must go into them, Ego Magan, Pinesuak, Ego Mixion to them. Mr. Magin to them, my cassite. Greetings, my relatives. My name is uh, Wolf and Buck. Originally from a Pasca Cree Nation in uh, North Central Manitoba on the banks of the Saskatchewan River opposite the town of the Paw. Coming to you today from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Nice, sunny Winnipeg, Manitoba. Finally, I'm honored to be allowed to uh, speak in this series. And I'm uh, very honored to be uh, allowed to address some of the faculty of my uh, alma mater. And uh, like uh, Merle, uh, Merle was saying that uh, I am in Inu, Cree is what we uh, were known as. 
Inenu is what we call ourselves. The term Inenu uh, translates as uh, of the four. That's the uh, translation of it. And uh, of the four refers to uh, a number of things. And uh, so when you look at the word Inenu, the root word for that is Neo. And Neo is four. Biak, Niso, Nisto, Neo. Neo, so that four, it is so of the four. Of the four represents one of the understandings is that uh, when we came into this reality, into this uh, this place with Aishki, this uh, this earth here, uh, we took a physical form, and that physical form was made made from the uh, elements that were immediately around us, which is the air, earth, wind, and fire. And uh, those are the four four elements that. Uh, we created our energy into a physical into a physical form, and uh, that's why we refer to ourselves as of the four. But also, of the four represents the four parts of the uh, Inenyo Neoho Nation, the Cree Nation, which stretches from BC right across to northern uh, Quebec and into uh, the states of Montana and North Dakota, South Dakota. And uh, in the east, you have the Mustasini Cree, the High Rock Cree. And you have the swampy Cree, and you have the woodlands Cree, and you have the plains Cree. And again, those are of the four. So today I, I've uh, been asked to speak a little bit about, uh, I guess, the Cree worldview and in your understanding of, uh, of this reality and our place in it. And also the aspects of uh, how we went about uh, looking at our world and how we uh, went about utilizing the natural world around us. Uh, for um, in Inyo, and for, I, I guess I could safely say for all indigenous cultures throughout the world, they're, uh, they're what, what we call, uh, the English term they use is spirit. And uh, I have a hard time using that word spirit because spirit con connotes, uh, Think right away, you say spirit, and right away people start thinking about ghosts and they start thinking about spiritualism and spiritualists. And, and uh, when my people talk about spirit, there, there's words that, that, that are used like achak, achak. It refers to uh, energy, it refers to light. And uh, throughout the, uh, the colonial process, uh, these words have been equated to spirit. And so people, people tend to say we're, we're spiritual people. And uh, our elders tell us that we're not spiritual people. Our elders tell us we come here as uh, we're, we, uh, we're energy, we're light. And uh, we come here and we change form, we take a physical form. And uh, we come here and we come to learn, we come to visit. And then when we're finished here, we revert back to energy. So we're energy, take, change form, then revert back to energy. And uh, one of my astrophysicist friends say, uh, told when I was asking about, when she asked about that and I told her some of the basic concepts, she said, uh, what you're referring to there is particle theory. And I said, yeah, that's what we're referring to. because That's what we believe. We're energy. And we take, form, take, take a physical form and then we revert back to energy. There's no such, for, prior to coming to the Europeans, for us, there was no such thing as heaven or hell or uh, the lim limiting factors of uh, limiting our God to be a old man sitting up in the sky. We had no concept of Kitsumanto, our creator. And we, we, we couldn't dare to say that uh, his, uh, his reach only stretched on earth, this little part of, of our reality. And so, so we believe, that's why we, we believe in energy because energy is everywhere. We, we, we know that energy is everywhere. And wh whenever we do anything, it's based on on that that concept, energy, and uh, people like to equate that to spirit, and uh, that's that's where I I, uh, I I feel very uncomfortable when people relate in that concept, because uh, they they as soon as they relate in that concept, they start thinking about uh, connecting it to other uh, other systems of belief. Like I was uh, speaking with the, uh, an educator last uh, last week. I was up in Churchill, and they were asking me what uh, what indigenous people believe prior to coming to Europeans. 
So I talked about energy. I talked about uh, spirit. Uh, as a spirit in, in relation to to energy and light, and that uh, we, uh, we we we're here. We visit here, and then when we uh, we're finished visiting here, we leave and we revert back to energy. And right away, you brought up the concept about reincarnation. And uh, I had to say, uh, I'm sorry that uh, isn't isn't what meant by by spirit. We we don't uh, retain any memory of. Uh, what we did here when we were here, because we're energy. We don't have a little uh, memory stick and we can reboot ourselves all the time. It's, it's not like that. We just continue our journey somewhere else. Because um, in our reality, space, uh, this place here, Otaski, this earth is only one little cosmic uh, microcosm of the vast, the vastness of, our, of reality. And uh, we don't limit ourselves to just staying, staying at this one place, this little place here. Because, uh, Creator didn't want it. We're told that Creator made energy and energy is everywhere. So therefore we can go everywhere. And so uh, for indigenous peoples, when we talk about spirit, we talk about Atsaka, we talk about Mantua, we talk about Wagana, we talk about Ntutemak. There's multiple, multiple uh, understandings about uh, this uh, concept of spirit. And it all boils down to energy at all time. There's a, a, a word that uh, one of my uh, mentors told me in relation to the sky and in relation to those stars in the sky, which they say, uh, where we come from, we come from up there. And there's a word in Cree that, uh, it, it, the, the word is kishikuokak. Uh, kishikuokak, when you, uh, it, it refers to beings of light, beings, uh, beings of energy specifically. The, uh, the root word for Kishikukak is Kishikau. Kishikau. When you say Tansi uh, Kishikau, that means that energy, that light that's up in the sky in the daytime. Kishikau, it means the, the light of day, the energy of day. So Kishikukak, again, refers to that light, that energy. Kishikukak is the being of light, being of energy. And uh, so my people had a, had a specific term when, when, when they were talking about that. And they... Uh, we're told prior to the coming of the Europeans, the belief systems that uh, that people had were uh, of a holistic nature. And uh, being of a holistic nature, nothing was uh, compartmentalized. Nothing, nothing was. Uh, you couldn't be an expert at, uh, at 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 one little specific thing because uh, you had to take in the world around you as uh, beings of energy living in, in, in a reality, every atom um, that, that, uh, that you possess and every atom around you is in relation to something that, that came from up there. The sci scientists say that uh, 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 a supernova, we, we are the products of supernova. All the dust, all the elements are, are, are of, of a supernova. And that's, 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 that's what comprises who we are. And in that same same understanding, that's what my people believe, is that we are a product of everything around us, and we can't be. Uh, there's there's a term that uh, when I was going to university, and uh, there's a term that uh, that was used that I I always wondered about. They say we are uh, they're doing an experiment, and they say we're passive observers. And uh, I tell my elders about this, and they they chuckle. They said, how can they be pass passive observers just by being there? They're influencing something. They're part of this reality. They can't magically disconnect themselves from this reality because they're there. And just simply by being there and watching and looking, they're, they're, they're interacting. They're, they're being a part of. So they, they'd wondered about that. And to me, that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we interact with our reality. I mean, we can't be uh, separate from it. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to talk to a lot of uh, elders, and I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of astrophysicists and scientists, and I had a lot of opportunity to fast, and a lot of opportunity to dream, and vision quest, and I had a lot of opportunity to travel, and I was as I was doing these things, one of the elders pointed out to me that. Uh, 
what you're doing there is uh, you're doing uh, what, what you call in educational circles methodologies. You're, you're, do, you're practicing your people's methodologies. This is how your people come to knowledge. Your people come to knowledge. Our people come to knowledge by fasting, by dreaming, by traveling, by sharing with people, by talking with people, by singing, by, by interacting with the world around you, by sitting out in nature. And, and uh, the, the, the most specific understanding that connects everything all together is spirit, is energy, is light, and is dreams. These are, are the main, uh, main ones for, for uh, the methodologies of, uh, of the indigenous peoples throughout the world. And uh, this, is, this is what differs from the methodologies of, uh, of Western science. Of course, we have things, of course, like uh, observation. Observation is very important. And experimentation and, uh, and inquiry and uh, theorizing and uh, those types of things. But, but, but what, what differs greatly, of course, is the idea of uh, dreams have, having a part to play in this process. And uh, one of the elders told me that uh, they said, Pwamiak, those dreams are very important. Dreams are what make our reality, they tell, they told us. They said, you think about it, dreams, everybody in the world dreams. It doesn't matter if you don't remember what your dreams are, you dream. Once your body is at rest, your mind starts to dream. And uh, they, they say that uh, everything, that if you look in the world around you, everything that you're surrounding you right now, at one point was a dream. And then somebody had an idea. So dreams are the birthplace of ideas. Dreams are the birthplace of questions. Dreams are the birthplace of understandings. Dreams are the birthplace of knowledge. Dreams are the birthplace of uh, guidance, of healing. So dreams are all these things. And uh, so the reality we're surrounded, we immerse ourselves in, was, was, a, was a dream, was an idea at some point. And, and until somebody moved forward with that idea and, and made it a reality. And so dreams play a very important part in, 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 uh, in, in the Cree understanding of, of the world around them. And for myself, I, uh, I, I uh, use dreams quite a bit to help me understand. And uh, because dreams, the, uh, the driving factor behind our dreams is, is, of course, the, the human mind, the human brain. And uh, that human brain is, uh, is totally fascinating. Mama Scott, we say, uh, it's, wonder, it's wondrous. And that it is the, the, uh, the, the only thing I can equate it with now is a supercomputer. This is way beyond a super, our brain is way beyond a supercomputer. Our brain goes 24-7. And it makes little intricate connections that we can never even think of in our subconscious. Some people call it the subconscious. They make connections. It makes connections all the time. And these connections form ideas. And it connects, it's totally connected to everything around us. And it's always formulating things. And uh, come to an understanding that uh, dreams, they, they give us ideas when we're, when we're puzzled about something and you ponder it and you ponder it and you ponder it. And then sometime maybe in the middle of the night, you, you, you wake up and you say, oh, that's what that is. Or, oh, that's what that was. And uh, our elders even go so far, they say that dreams give us glimpses of infinite possibilities. When we sleep, we dream. And when we dream, we're always dreaming about something. Our, 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 our mind is just constantly working and it's giving flashes about the information that it read from whatever we saw that day, but also the experiences that happened to us. And, and, and they formulate these things and they give us flashes of uh, possibilities that could happen. And so we're always getting infinite possibilities of what can happen. And then sometimes in our waking lives, we're sitting there thinking and saying, hey, this happened before. Or hey, this is done, we've done this before. The, uh, of course, the uh, French call it deja vu. But uh, our, our elders say that that happens because you dreamt about it you that possibility was shown you and through, through a certain uh, chain of events happened to make that possibility a reality and so again i was explaining this to a astrophysicist friend of mine about some of the understandings about dreams and uh, what they told me was well what 
from what I understand is what they're they seem to be talking about there is uh, quantum theory and uh, the idea of uh, the infinite possibilities that that can happen if certain events fall in a certain way or, or if you observe or don't observe certain things and I thought that was pretty cool so our elders con contemplated these things but but the important factor there is that in our reality, in our holistic understanding of our reality, everything is encompassed in these concepts. When you talk about dreams, and uh, we're connected to the sky, we're told, in our dreams. In, in uh, Cree understanding, if we look up in the sky, there's a certain place up in the sky called Pagwangizik, the hole in the sky. And... Uh, Astronomers and uh, call that the Pleiades, the seven sisters. So my people call that Pagwangizik, the hole in the sky. And this group of stars is uh, fairly important throughout the world. I've had opportunity to uh, talk with indigenous people throughout the world in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, they always point out that group of stars as a very, very important place to their people. And so for my people, we call that Pagwangizik, the hole in the sky. And they're saying that's uh, that's where we originate from. And uh, in, in regard to uh, in regard to that, when they're talking about hole in the sky, they're referring to, referring to a spatial anomaly. They're referring to a wormhole. They're re referring to a portal into another reality. And they say that's why our dreams, when we sleep, our our our, uh, our energy connects to that hole in the sky and we're bombarded with possibilities because we're getting glimpses of other realities. And I think, holy smokes. Uh, I was talking about, uh, now, now, now I, I wanna go see a Doctor Strange in multiple multiple universes. But yeah, that's what, that's what they were talking about. A spatial anomaly, a wormhole, or connect to other realities because uh, our people understand that there's other realities out there because uh, they say it's crazy, it's nonsense to limit our reality to only what we see and only what we can think about because they say Kitsumanto, our creator, is, uh, is infinite. Kitsumanto, our creator, had a thought. So when Kitsumanto, our creator, had a thought, he thought about us and we came into being. We came into being as energy, as light. And uh, so creator had these thoughts and as creator thought, whatever creator thought about came into being. And uh, so creator thought about us. And so we as uh, beings of energy, beings of light came into being and being that we're directly created and we're connected to Kitsuman to our creator from, from that thought process, we have all the energy of creator, which is the energy and the light. And since creator can never die, we're told, then the energy that we're directly created to can never die also. It only, it only can change form. And so we go on forever, the energy. It goes on forever and it, it just changes form. And then they go on to say that, okay, since creator can never die, can never, can never end, right now at this very second, creation is still happening. Creation is still being made. So it's crazy for us to think that we understand about our reality because right now at this very second, creation is still being created. And there, therefore we only understand up they tell us, up just a little bit. We understand just a little bit of that reality that we can see. And there's a term that's used in Cree, it's called mi so. Mi so refers to all that is. The, the, I guess the most simplest understanding is is to equate that to that phrase, all that is. And when they say all that is, what they're referring to there is the known and the unknown. We understand that there's a lot of stuff we don't know about, but that's okay. Because uh, we're not trying to, uh, trying to, 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 uh, to say that we, know, we, we think we have the thinking processes of creator because we don't, we don't understand. Moikashiki iten. We don't understand, just very little, but we're okay with that. And uh, because we, we know that uh, 
our energy continues on and at some point we'll know a little more as we go along. So uh, one of the things about that is our elders tell us is that uh, we go into a ceremony and the elders tell us that uh, in that ceremony, we see lights and we see energy and we're surrounded by energy, we're surrounded by light, we're surrounded by the, uh, the four states of matter when we go into ceremony. And again, those are of the four. But uh, that, that energy, it, it, it reveals itself in, uh, in those states of matter. And it's part of us and we're part of that, that energy. And uh, we understand that uh, it's everywhere. Everything that we do is part of that energy. And everything has repercussions. Everything has responsibilities. We send out ripples. Whatever we do, we send out ripples through time and space. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, we have to be understanding that uh, whatever we do has consequences for those in the future. And whatever people did in the past have consequences for us now. And uh, that sky connects us to all these things, all these realities. And uh, they tell us that uh, if you look up into that sky, then everything you ever need to know is up there. I had an opportunity to uh, talk with an elder by the name of uh, Ken Goodwill. And Ken Goodwill was from uh, Standing Buffalo in uh, Saskatchewan. And he worked with the uh, First Nations University. And I was there visiting one day. And I was uh, visiting, uh, I was going to visit Dr. Herman Michel and from uh, Northern Manitoba. And uh, I, uh, I just happened upon a pipe ceremony that was happening. Some elders were having a pipe ceremony and they invited me to sit in with them. So I did. Then they got to talk and they asked me why I was, uh, why I was over there for. And I told them I was uh, begin to research about the stars and about uh, what our people's understanding of the stars were. So he said, well, I'm going uh, out to a place called Wanuskewin in Saskatoon. And if you want to come along, we're going to go look at the stars, he said. I said, okay, that'd be cool. So I, I went with him. And uh, so it, it's, it's a September night, late September night, cold. And we're standing outside in the Northern Plains, outside the city of Saskatoon, at a place called Wanuskewin, looking at the sky. And he, he told me, he said, every star you can see with the naked eye, out here in this sky, our people had a constellation. There was a name. Specific stars had names and they were connected to ceremony. Constellations had names, had songs, had teachings, and they were connected to ceremony. So every single star in that sky, we understood about. And there were specific people that were designated as uh, those knowledge keepers were specifically about Achagosak, those stars. And they dedicated their lives to understanding that star, that sky world and its relation and its instructions to us. And through the uh, historical trauma that happened to our people, we lost 85% of that knowledge base. And so uh, now, we're just now looking up at that sky and starting to reclaim those constellations. And he said, what you're doing, then you got to keep doing it because the students have to know about this, these stars. These stars tell us, tell them about their history. These stars tell them about who they are. These stars tell them about their connection to reality. These stars tell them about their understandings and depth of knowledge of their people. And they're not getting that in, in, in the education system. So what you're doing is good. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it and uh, you're meant to do it, then things will happen and uh, it, it'll unfold in front of you. And this wasn't the first time that one of the elders told me that. When I first began this journey about looking at the stars, way back in, I think it was uh, 2007, 2006, 2007, is when I started researching the sky, the Cree sky. One of the elders told me that, yeah, what you're doing is, uh, is good. And he told me all this stuff. And he said, uh, you know, don't worry about it. He said, because if you were meant to do these things, then people will be put in your place. Events will be put in your place. Uh, and uh, things will be put in your place and, and it will, they will unfold in front of you. And if you're meant to do this, then it'll be given to you. Basically, all you have to do is go out and look for it. And uh, so that's what happened. And uh, so 
with these elders telling me that. And uh, yeah, th that's that's the case. I started with uh, one constellation, the Big Dipper. <coughs> a group of stars in the Big Dipper. And uh, similar to Ursa Major, is uh, the one, one, uh, one uh, Atimuinak. Atimuinak is what we call the, uh, a narrative. Again, there's another term in English, stories. I don't like to use the term stories. Again, stories bring their own connotations with them. And uh, so at some point, uh, these uh, tellings, I, I, I had one when I started this journey. And uh, this this uh, telling I had came from uh, from uh, Kineseo Siupi. Kineseo Siupi is a uh, fish, fish river. But uh, fish river on the maps in uh, northern Manitoba is known as Norway House on the northern tip of uh, Lake Winnipeg. And there was an elder by the name of Myrtle Scribe who uh, talked about uh, Atsak, Atsagos, Atsagosak and uh, Ochik the fisher and how the fisher was in the sky and uh, that fisher was uh, part of that fisher was the Big Dipper. So that's the only story I ever heard about from a, a Cree perspective, any perspective other than Roman Greek because Going to going to school, uh, of course, that's all I heard about was Roman Greek, and uh, I, I came to the assumption that I guess nobody else knew anything about the sky other than Romans and Greeks. So that's all we ever hear about. And uh, so I, when I when I heard this story, I was really intrigued. And uh, so when when I started doing the research, I had one story, but things started falling into place happened across a portable inflatable planetarium at a, a, a science uh, teacher science convention in uh, in uh, Austin, Texas. They were having a teacher science convention and they were displaying these portable planetariums. And I said, hey, this is what I need. I, I need this. I can go to the schools and I can show the kids this and you know in, in the middle in the middle of uh, in, in May in the middle of June don't have to wait till the winter time. When it's nice and dark out, they can go outside. And so we, we purchased it, and I started uh, taking this around with my one little story. And pretty soon, I had two little stories, and then three little stories, and four little stories. And as I went around, I, I, I mean, I started gathering more stories. People started giving me all kinds of stories. So that that was that was quite a while back, back in 2000, 2006, 2007, when we started. So now, up to this point, I'm at probably about. 36, 37 constellations that we've relocated and reconnected with. And this is just specifically the Cree stars. This is not the uh, Ojibwe stars. This is not the, the Lakota stars, Dakota stars. This is not the Blackfoot stars. They have their own star systems and their own understandings. And they, they too are, are delving into those understandings and reconnecting to that sky. And what they're finding is a depth of knowledge, a depth of understanding and intellectual capacity that every culture in the face of the earth has. And uh, again, and we're reinforced in, in that research by uh, our elders telling us, yes, this is what the kids need. The, the students need to know this. They know they need to know that there's a depth of understanding. There's a, a capacity for intellectual thought in the processes of their people. And they're not just a simplistic, super superstitious uh, beliefs. They're they're, uh, they're compatible. Some of those concepts are compatible with any scientific theory that's being put forward right now. And then I started running to astrophysicists and astronauts and sharing with them and traveling. And that's another part of our uh, our uh, methodology is that travel and that sharing. One of the uh, when I told one of the elders that. Uh, I was, I was uh, trying to go about uh, putting together steps and how we uh, come to knowledge. And the uh, very first thing they told me was, you got to include travel in there. You have to include travel because our people traveled all the time. And when you travel, you expose your mind, you expose your body, you expose your whole, your whole being to someplace new. And when you're sitting talking with somebody totally new, especially from a, a different nation, then again, you're opening your mind to our possibilities you're making connections with what you thought already prior knowledge and, and everything's connecting so traveling is very important especially as uh, as youth young people they should travel all the time they said 
And I thought this made so much sense because, yeah, as uh, just uh, going through university and uh, listening to some of my perspective professors and uh, some people that uh, that idolize like uh, Neil Tyson DeGrasse and uh, he's traveling all the time and he's talking with people who are like minded in him and he's coming up with them awesome ideas. So that, that, that just says, yeah, travel is, is awesome. And uh, if you travel, you meet people with like minds and you come you make connections and you come up with fantastic ideas. I got a funny story for you. I was, uh, I was at a, I was at a uh, staff meeting. We were having a staff meeting in Broken Head, First Nation, in uh, one of the meeting rooms, uh, conference rooms. So we're sitting there one June day, about five years ago, having a conversation. And uh, my phone, my phone rings. So I answered the phone. I said, hello, this is Walter Buck. And he said, hello. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, could I, do you have a minute? I, I need to speak with you. I said, okay, uh, I'm in a meeting right now, but uh, yeah, okay. So I walked off to the side and he said, yes, this is the assistant of uh, Neil Tyson DeGrasse. And uh, we need to speak with you. And I said, shut up. And I hung up. <laughs> And then anyways, I thought somebody was pulling my leg. So I went back and again, my phone rings again. And again, it's it's, it's that same lady. So I, I took time and I, I talked to her and uh, she invited me to, uh, they wanted me to go present at the Hayden Planetarium at that point, which I thought was pretty awesome. Yeah, so uh, so travel is very is very important. Uh, according to that's another one, another central methodology of our people, traveling. And uh, the, the the art of uh, the, the the whole aspect of creativity, the whole creative process, singing, dancing, painting, coloring, drawing, all those things, sports, all those things again, are are part of, of of that methodology, and we have to include that. And our whole being, and when we take in the world around us, everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we uh, we smell, we touch, we feel. That has to be part of our methodological process. And uh, w- when we, we start doing these things, then we, uh, we, we, so we, uh, our energy attracts like, like minds. And these, these like minds make connections and, and brand new amazing things are, are, are formed. And our elders told us that this is part of, and ceremony again is another one that's very important in, in, in the process. And again, when we talk about energy, we talk about sitting in ceremony with somebody and uh, understanding that uh, we're part of a, we're a small part of, of a bigger reality. And uh, we try to find our, 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 uh, our way in this process. And the elders tell us that uh, a good example of uh, finding our way in this process is uh, when we're given a name or others say, as being of the energy, we have a name. And when we come to this reality and take a physical form as a human, then it's our job to find what that name is because that name will guide us. That name will tell us what we have to do. And, uh, and so uh, we, we come to uh, equate that name right now to, again, to English, to the English term, spirit, spirit names. And uh, so, anyways, uh, that name is 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 the uh, the name that that guides you through life. It's sort of like a career path. You get that name, and then even if you don't understand what that name means right at the immediate the time you're given that name, as your life goes on, those connections will be made, and you'll, you'll be begin more to understand what that name means and what it represents, and and how how you should be working and where you should be working and what you should be doing. My name given to me was Puame Negate Tichigo. Puame Negate Tichigo. The literal translation of that name is he has dreamt a dream and keeps it. But you can be shortened to the dream keeper. And uh, in, in that regard, that name I was given, when I was given that name, I was given a, a dream. And this dream was translated by a little girl. And this little girl, her name is Flora, and uh, the, she's uh, mentally mentally handicapped, I guess you could say. She had a, she will always forever be uh, 
have the the mental the mental capacity of a of an eight year old. Right now, if I say, I'd say right now at this moment, she's 32, but she has that mental capacity of an eight year old. And uh, when when she when she was born, the doctors told her mother not to and father that uh, she shouldn't uh, they should should let her let her pass on because uh, she'd be a vegetable all her life and uh, she'd be handicapped all her life. And they said it, it wouldn't be a uh, wouldn't be good for her or for the parents to uh, to go through that. But the parents said, "No, we're not gonna, we're not gonna believe you." So they took her to a ceremony, and the elders told her that, "Well, you gotta have to look after this this girl. She's a, she's a special girl." And so they did. And so Flora Flora lives. She still lives. And anyways, in a dream, she came to me in a dream, along with my teacher. And uh, they gave me this uh, this dream. And they gave me this name, Bwami Negatiitsiko. And in the dream, the dream had to do with water. Clear, clear water. It had to do with uh, stars. It had to do with uh, pencils, pencil of all things, pencils. And it had to do with the sky. And it had to do with young people. And so at the time, at the time I was given this name, I, I, I had a grade seven education. I just finished quitting drugs and alcohol. Prior to prior to my connecting with with my with my teacher, my mentor. I lived on the streets. I ran away from home when I was 12. I was a, uh, a product of the child welfare system and the Children's Aid Society. And I was adopted out when I was uh, six years old. So at 12, I uh, got tired of where I was staying and I ran away. And I lived on the streets. I lived on the streets from I was about 12 till I was about 25, I'd say. I lived on the streets and all the streets, all the skid roads in uh, Western Canada, in Vancouver, in Edmonton, in Calgary, in Regina, in Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, all these places. I was intimate with these kid rows. I was into crime. I was into drugs. I was into alcohol. I was into violence. And I was into everything. And I did anything and everything to, to survive. And it wasn't until uh, I heard a call when I was in Edmonton one time. The elders sent out a message to all the youth all over Canada. They said, if you want to learn about your culture, if you want to learn about your history, if you want to learn about your language, if you want to learn about your heritage, if you want to learn about your ceremony, come to this place and we'll teach you. And so I ended up at that place and they started teaching me. And I left those streets. I left the alcohol. I left the drugs. And I had a grade seven education. And so one of the things I did to fill the void that alcohol and drugs and crime and all the other stuff once those were removed, I had this big, huge void in my life, and so I I, uh, I went to uh, went to school, and I obtained uh, two degrees from the University of Manitoba after completing my upgrading, and uh, from there, I uh, I became a teacher, an educator. I taught for 25 years in ed various education systems in Winnipeg, all over Manitoba, and on the reserves. And one thing about, about uh, being an educator in Winnipeg. Is uh, being uh, who I am as an Aboriginal person, whatever school, I, every school I went to, I was the instant uh, expert on anything Indigenous. Even though I didn't know nothing about Indigenous myself, I was uh, I was the instant expert just because of uh, the color of my skin. And so I, I decided, well, if I'm going to be uh, an expert, I better find out about something. And so I started going to, uh, I passed tobacco and I asked, uh, one of the knowledge keepers to teach me about the ceremony, to teach me about the sacred pipe, to teach me about the songs, to teach me about all these things. And that's what happened. That's what I did. And that's how I uh, I left that, uh, that that dark world behind me and uh, entered a new uh, new phase in my life. And uh, through all that, the, the name Puami Negate Ichigo, it drew me through the educational system. And it was not my wasn't my my doing. It was it was just how things were, were, were put in place, the elder said. Because of that name, this is what dragged you forward. When I when I when I uh, graduated from grade twelve in uh, October, no, it was uh, September. It was a hot no a hot a hot August. Because I graduated grade twelve in August. I was going to the adult education center in Winnipeg, in Bond Street. And I graduated uh, in August. And a week prior to my graduation, 
my uh, one of my great my grade 12 math teacher came up to me and she said you know you should apply for university there's this there's this, uh, program at the university of manitoba you can go apply for and she gave me all the information and she said so soon as soon as you finish your graduation ceremonies here go out to the university and apply so i said okay sure i'll do that so I, I did the graduation ceremony, and then the next day, the next morning, I got on the bus and I went down to University of Manitoba. And I went into this big room, and there was this big room. And in this big room, there was about 60, 70 people in this room. And uh, I asked them, well, what was going on here? Everybody, there's a program that's running here for a, a BSW, that's for a social work. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a social worker to go help my people. And uh, so, uh, I said, I looked around and I said, holy smokes, how many positions are open? And they said, uh, 16. I said, holy smokes. So I walked out of that room and I said, forget about it. So much for that idea, I said. And so I'm walking down the road, walking down the hallway. And I came, I passed this other room. And in this other room, there's about 10 people in it. And I looked around and I said, what's going on here? And so this is a, educa- this is a, a, a program for education. You can get your B.Ed. here. I said, well, how many positions are open? They said, 16. I said, okay, well, this is where I'll apply. <laughs> and that's how I became a teacher. And that's how I got my B.Ed. But in, in all that, 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 that dream, that name, Puami Negite Tichigo, because the elder said, that name is the name that will carry you through life. And that name had to do with education. That name had to do with stars. That name had to do with youth. And after all that, after all that process, yeah, that's what I ended up doing. All these things that they, they told me I would do. And uh, I thought that was pretty awesome. And, and so our, our, uh, that's one of the things that I, I do all the time is I always give names. In ceremony, as a ceremonial leader, people come to me, all kinds of people, especially young ones, and they ask my names. And I, I, I ask the grandmothers and grandfathers, the, the energies in the, uh, in the sweat lodge, Matutsan, about who, who these people are, what, who these spirits are, and they show me their names. I had a, I, I was in a Sapu, Sapu Ewitak, doing a planetarium show, and uh, the principal there, she was, a, she was a young lady at the time, and uh, she just graduated from university uh, two, two years prior, and she was the principal at her reserve now, and she asked me, uh, could you, you think you could give some students some names after the, after your presentation, we'll make a sweat lodge and you can do a sweat lodge. And I said, sure, that sounds good. I'll do that. So, so after the presentation, the next day we, uh, we set up a sweat lodge and so I'm, I'm sitting, getting ready to sweat lodge ready. And there's a uh, couple kids approach me and they have tobacco and cloth. And they said, these ones want names. I said, okay. And then she, then the principal says, uh, oh, and the other ones were going to be here in a little while. And so next thing I look up and there's 26 people standing in line and they're all wanting names. <laughs> and I said, holy smokes. And here I am sitting there because usually when I give names, there's a, I need singers because while I'm praying, the, the songs are sung. And so I'm sitting there thinking, well, what am I going to do? I got no singers. And there's just me here and a couple of the teachers that were helping with the rocks and getting the lodge ready. So I'm thinking about that. And as I'm thinking about that, this old truck drives up and these two uh, two guys jump out, and they come running, and they say, "Hey, we 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 somebody told us you're having a sweat here." I said, "Yeah, you mind if we come? We we know songs." He said, "We'll sing for you." <laughs> I said, "Okay, this is how it's supposed to go." I said, "All right," and so that's what that's what happened, and I, I ended up giving 26 kids their names, and uh, they still have their names, and uh, some of them are graduating now with with, with their names. And this this never ha- this ha- this happened more than once. We have a lineup of kids getting names. So yeah, these names identify who we are. They guide us in what we in the, in the work that we have to do in our lives. They're sort of like our uh, our, our career paths, our, our chosen career fields. And all this is part of the uh, methodological process of our people. And it includes everything. It's, it's not just uh, today, today, or uh, at this part. I'm a, I'm a ceremonial person. I'm, I'm all those, all these other things also, and they they all have to be included in what it is that I do, and how it is I relate to my people, and how it is I relate to everybody. And all these things are uh, 
are part and parcel to uh, to following those met methodological steps into understanding of uh, all these things that we do. So I, uh, the uh, the methodologies are are uh, fairly important. Somebody told me that uh, at some point I should uh, make a book about all these things and talk about these methodologies and how they are, they're relevant, especially to the young people who are going through universities now. Because uh, I know as a, as a young person going through university and then uh, coming out of university and then becoming an instant expert in, the, in all, all things indigenous, that uh, it wasn't so for me because I knew that I didn't know nothing about all things indigenous. I knew things about, if they would have told me you're an expert about living on the streets, I would have said, oh, no problem, I know that because I lived on those streets. But even living on those streets gave me an in with a lot of the young people, a lot of the students, because uh, uh, I, I knew a lot of where a lot of them were coming from, because I was there. I lived that, lived that process, lived that crime, lived that jail, did the time, and uh, so the, all these all these processes are part and parcel to who we are as a person. There's young there's young people that are coming out of universities that uh, haven't. Uh, been exposed to their culture. The, uh, a lot of them go to university to get reintroduced to their culture, which I found pretty pretty odd. I was at a place called uh, Saskatch in Saskatoon at a place called uh, Jodiket uh, High School, Jodiket Memorial School. And uh, it's run by the Catholic uh, School Board in Saskatoon. And uh, Jodiket, by the way, was uh, one of the elders that, that uh, sent out the message to us young people that if you wanted to learn to uh, about our culture, our history, and all that stuff to uh, to come to this place. Joe, Joe Duquette was one of those people that, uh, one of the elders that called us, and uh, one of the people I listened to, and I respect very much. And he's from Mr. Wasis, Saskatchewan. And anyways, there's a school named after him in Saskatoon, and I was at that school one day uh, doing a presentation with the planetarium. And I, as uh, we were sitting there, one of the elders came up to me and he said, he said, look at all these kids here. And said, this is a high school. So I was looking at all these grade 9, 10, 11, 12s. And uh, he said, all these kids are here. You know why all these kids are here? And I said, yeah, they're here to uh, get an education. He said, that's a, a little bit of it, but that's not the real reason they're here. The real reason they're here is to learn about their history, to learn about their culture, to be part of ceremony. That's why they're here, because they can't get this on the reserve, they said. It's, it's ironic that they have to leave the reserves and come to the city and the, to a Catholic school to get their, their culture. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is ironic. But, but that's what's happening. And that's what's happening with the university system. Now. A, lot of those, a lot of those young people that are leaving their reserves coming to universities, they're, they're, they get a, a taste of their culture in, into these schools, into these uh, institutions. And it's very important that uh, the taste that they get is, is, has a depth to it. And has has the intellectual capacity, and it connects to a lot of the concepts that are are presented in these systems. It's very important that they know that, and then they leave they leave that place knowing a bit more about their history, and about their culture, and about their depth of knowledge, and they're about their intellectual capacity from from a from an indigenous perspective, not only from a Western perspective. So those are some of the things I'd like to share with you. I see, I can see the time is uh, about an hour already. So uh, if there are any questions, I guess I could turn it over to Merle and... Yes, uh, thank you, Wilfred. Uh, that was a very good talk, uh, learning about uh, the Indian new methodologies. And a lot of uh, what you said are, are teachings that we have as well in uh, my Anishinaabe Bay way of upbringing. Uh, these are some that the uh, uh, different methodologies that, that we have as well. And um, uh, you talk about the dreams, the naming, ceremony, etc., cetera, as, a, as part of these methodologies where uh, we acquire knowledge of the different uh, knowledge that's not written, but bridges uh, uh, the Western science. So these are very interesting. And I think at this time, I'm going to uh, leave it uh, leave it open to the audience if if uh, someone has a question to ask, if you want to write it in the chat, Miguel is going to 
read out the questions or else if anybody has question, uh, I see Miguel has his hand up. Miguel? Uh, yes, uh, thanks Marla. I think Brian also uh, has his hand up, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, Wilfred, very nice presentation. I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is how, how many, how many people during all these years have you thought you know about your your journey uh you know because this is i i felt very moved by your story right how you were you know you had a you finished late in high school and then you move into the university system and then you started to teach to the indigenous people so uh, how, how many students have you taught during all these years that you have been involved in education system? That's my first question. <laughs> and I know it could be, you know, countless, but I just gonna, gonna have like a sense of how many people have you encouraged or motivate. And that's my first question. And then I will ask you my second question and then I will uh, uh, pass the, the questions to others. But uh, that's my first question. Okay, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a big question. Yeah, so when I finished university, I was uh, actively uh, involved in the uh, indigenous uh, indigenous uh, community of Winnipeg, the inner city. And uh, in the inner city of Winnipeg, there's a lot of uh, probably about six high schools that have about 99% population of indigenous people, indigenous youth. And uh, so we, we were working, it was about... Uh, a, uh, a cohort of about eight of us that got together and we were just young. Uh, a, lot, a lot of us were in universities ourselves and uh, we, we started working with these youth and we asked these youth from the, those high schools what it is that they wanted to see in their education system. And uh, they wanted to see their language. They wanted to see their culture. They wanted to be involved in their ceremony. They wanted to know about their history. And they want, but they also wanted that wanted academic standards. These are what they wanted. And so, uh, holding about five or six uh, big, huge uh, gatherings with these students, or any, anywhere from uh, 300 to 400 participated, we came up with the uh, uh, four central four central needs that they that they, they we want they wanted us to address. And so we approached the uh, indigenous community of Winnipeg and we asked. Uh, if we could uh, go about uh, uh, fighting for the, these uh, these these four things, and uh, so they elected a uh, a body called the Thunderbird uh, Society, and uh, our, our goal was to uh, was to establish the Indigenous based high school within this uh, this uh, Winnipeg School Division One and in uh, in the central central area of Winnipeg, and so that's what we did. That's what we uh, we we went went for. And that's how Children of Deer High School was uh, was established back in 1991. It opened its doors, and uh, that school had a capacity of 250 people, students. And then when we opened the doors, there was 700 people, 700 youth wanting to get in. And uh, so I taught there. I, I graduated that year, 1991, from uh, University of Manitoba, and I taught at that high school. And uh, so we thought thousands and thousands of kids, and since that time, through not only high school but but uh, in regard to a ceremony, uh, I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of not only youth but people of all ages, and uh, I try to uh, help them as best I can, guide them in their journey to uh, finding who they are. So yeah, that, that's a that's a pretty hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for the, my first question or for your, the answers to my first question. And uh, just a comment, I think you should write a book. And the, the, other, uh, the other question, and that would be my final question, uh, that is more like related to your um, astronomy background. How, so have you compared the, the constellations or, uh, that are present here in North America, for example, with other cultures, like for example, in South America or in Australia, have you compare the like the constellations in the, in that sense like uh, if there is, have you seen any uh, common constellation that could be shared between or or that could be shared that is shared for, for the um, culture here in North America as well as in other parts of the continent like in South America or 
in in Australia, for example, because I'm, I'm positive that they, they, they also have they, they will see other constellations, but they are called with different names, right? Depending on the mm -hmm. on the on the on the culture, right? For example, I know that the Incas they call it the they have like seven or eight constellations in the southern hemisphere, but I don't know mm -hmm. anything about the Australian or the o Oceania continent. But uh, I, I just wanted to know if you have any how you compare those uh, with other cultures. I would like just to know that. Thank you. Yes, uh, there's one particular uh, group of stars that uh, are pretty much uh, prevalent in the uh, northern hemisphere sky at certain times of the year and in the southern hemisphere sky. And these are one of them is the uh, Pleiades. And uh, indigenous cultures from all over the world identify those Pleiades as a very important place in, in, in their culture. And some of them say that even that's a, that's a place of origin. And so, yeah, people like the, the Mapuche, people like... Uh, like the uh, the Maori people, the uh, Hawaiian people, they, they talk about those group of stars. Yeah, so there's uh, there's that one specifically, but they have yeah they have some awesome stories about the, their own constellations that they have. And in regard to a nor a nor the northern hemisphere, there are certain groups of stars where uh, the same uh, perspective is seen. Like we look at the Big Dipper, one of the the terms we call that Big Dipper is Mr. Musqua, the Great Bear. And I came across about uh, four different understandings from different nations about about that bear, about those stars refer in reference to a bear. The Mi'kmaq people have a story about the bear. The uh, the Haudenosaunee people have a story about the Dipper and the bear. The Cree people, the Ojibwe people, the uh, Blackfoot people. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Wilfred. And I think I will pass now to Brian. And then we'll have Brian. questions from the audience. I will read it to you after Brian is done. Thanks, Miguel. Yeah, Wilfred, that was very inspiring. Um, you know, I your your life story is just uh, is is in incredibly interesting. And I, you know, we just um, as I was saying earlier, we just renovated our planetarium space here at the university, and it would be. And I see Danielle Pahud is here from our physics department. Um, it would be great to have you come and engage with us. Now that we're emerging out of the pandemic, we can start using these facilities, right? It'd be, it'd be you know, I'd love to have you come and, and have your perspectives on the astronomy and use the planetarium. I mean, I think there's lots we could do there together if you're interested. No, definitely yeah. interested in trying something, yeah, trying something out. Yeah, for sure. Let's follow up on that. Anyways, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, thanks again for joining us. I'll pass it off to Merle. Yeah, uh, we have a few questions on the side and Miguel is going to read them out and ask you. And uh, for those of you uh, that have questions, raise your hand, please, and then we'll get to you. Okay, Miguel. So we have a question from Kimia here. It says, uh, thank you so much, Wilfred, for this brilliant talk. I am an immigrant in Canada. As, uh, and as someone who has just become a permanent resident here, uh, they would like to know if they are responsible to educate themselves and others around uh, me about indigenous matters and history. What do you think is the most effective step uh, I could take? Thank you. Well, just uh, one of the steps that you could take is uh, just getting involved in the uh, some of the things that the indigenous people are doing in the, around the university, but also in, uh, in the community itself. Just uh, volunteering here and there. Because once you start volunteering here and there, then you're, you're exposing yourself to a wider, wider community, wider audience, and uh, you'll get invited to, uh, to, uh, to other, other uh, things that are happening. Uh, next question is as as Klimiak. Thank you so much, Wilfred, for this wonderful talk. It was wonderful to to receive these teachings from you. I wonder if you could explain a little bit. This is something that I'm confused on in my learning. Um, how do how do a Chaco's stars relate to kinship? When we think about our, our constellations of kinship, that's the connection I'm missing right now. Is that something you could help with? Uh, yeah, well, uh, 
Yeah, that's a that's a really really big question. But uh, in regard to uh, kinships, there's one specific uh, constellation up in the sky. It's called Nomeo. Nomeo is a sturgeon, and Nomeo swims in the Milky Way. The stars of Auriga, the stars of Perseus, and the stars of Andromeda. There's uh, seven main stars in those three constellations, which, which uh, constitute the uh, constellation Nomeo, Nomeo the Sturgeon. And the stars of Auriga touch one side of the Milky Way, and the stars of Andromeda touch the other side of the Milky Way, and the stars of Perseus swim right inside the Milky Way. And so those seven stars touch either side of the Milky Way and the main body of those stars swim inside the Milky Way. And we're told that's a time continuum. We're told it represents generations. It represents ancestors. It represents kinships. Those uh, seven main stars are the seven generations. And we're told that uh, the stars of Riga, where the nose of uh, Nomeo de Sturgeon is, that's the future. And the stars of Andromeda, where the tail of uh, Nomeo is, that's the past. And the body of uh, Nomeo the Sturgeon swimming in the Milky Way and the stars of Perseus are the are present. So in front of us, we have the, the, the future. Behind us, we have the past. So there, we're told that there's three generations in front of us and three generations behind us. And we are the, we are the, the, the center. We are the, connect, we are the connection from the past to the, from the future, from the past to the future. We are, we are the time continuum. So the three ahead of us, of course, are our are, are, are children, our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, and behind us are our parents, our grandparents, and our great grandparents. And in Cree, there's a term that identifies the great grandparents and the great grandchildren. The term is called Chapan. Chapan is uh, it translates as the ones that tie together. So our Chapan, our great grandchildren, tie together the future, and our our great grandparents tie together the past. So there's a time continuum in there, and there's ancestry involved, and the timeline and kinships, and it's all all has to do with our with the generations, and we have to know our, our bloodlines. That's that's one aspect of it, and the other one has to do with names, and the other one has to do with uh, just understanding the stars, what they represent themselves, as a chagosak, as spirit, as energy. Because in that regard, that energy is our energy. We are the same. We are one and the same. I hope that answered a little bit of your question. Yeah, thank you. That helps. Okay, thank you, Wilfred. Us, uh, Brian, uh, do you still have your hand up? Uh, do you have another question? No, I don't. It's just been okay. let out. Get down. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Michael. And then after that is Isabel and Carrie. Michael? Yes, thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Wilfred, for the presentation. And what, uh, I'm wondering if there were, you talked about oh, dreams being uh, important. And uh, for helping us understand and things in the subconscious, can you? Are there any important, interesting things you uh, found out you that you any connections you? What's the most interesting connection that you've made uh, from a dream? Well, there's lots of them. Lots of lots of connections. Like I said, uh, dreams give us instruction. They guide us. They give us healing. They give us understanding. They give us uh, aha moments. And uh, for instance, uh, I, I had this dream one night, and this was in the process, in the transition of uh, walking away from that alcohol and drugs and that life of crime and violence and all the other stuff that goes with it, and leaving that behind and. Uh, trying to find something else that was uh, that was important. And uh, during that time, it was a very lonely time because I had to uh, disconnect myself from that, that world. And I had no other world to connect to because uh, that's the only world I knew. And so I was uh, pretty much floating in the dark. And I had a dream one night. And in that dream, my, parent, my grandparents come and got me. 
my grandparents come and got me. They took me on a journey. They flew me back to a uh, back to uh, OCN of Oskiak, and into the log house, log cabin my uh, my grandfather built for my grandmother and all the grandchildren. It was a big two room log cabin, and I remember when I was uh, very small, I I helped my grandfather uh, mix that uh, mud with the straw and the mud, and we stomped on the uh, straw and the mud, and, and we put put that straw and the mud in between the, uh, the the log walls, and then he white we whitewashed them. And anyways, in the dream, my grandfather took me to that place, and we landed, and we went inside that house, and then one one side was a, the, a bedroom or a big huge living room bedroom, and the other side was a was a kitchen by itself. And uh, so in in the in living room bedroom, my my uh, mother my grandmother was uh, quilting. She was quilting uh, quilts by a coal oil lamp, and she waved at me as we went in, and it was just getting dusk out. And uh, so my grandmother, my grandfather opened the kitchen door and it was totally black in there. And he, he pushed me in. He pushed me inside and then he held a lamp over my head as I stood in the middle of that room. And as I stood in that room looking around, I could see all my relatives, all of them. I could see my aunts, my uncles, my mother and my father, my brothers, my sisters, all of them roaming around in the dark with their hands outstretched, walking around like this in the dark, shuffling around in the dark with their arms all stretched in a circle, just going slow around and around and around. And I was wondering why my uh, grandfather brought me to that place. And he said, oh, I go Newsom, it's time to go now. And he grabbed me and he dragged me out. As I was going out, I reached into the darkness and I grabbed something and I held onto it tight and then we left. And then he said, oh, Mata, he way, he told me. It's time to go, he told me. So as I was flying away, I looked down and I saw my grandfather and my brother and my grandmother are standing in the stoop in front of that cabin. And beside them was my cousin, Joe. And they were all waving at me. And then I woke up and this dream was just so vivid in my head. And I said, wow, that's amazing. And I was crying. And then uh, about a week later, my brother called me because my brother was always checking up on me to see because he knew I was uh, trying to sober up and, and, and trying to sober up for about the hundredth time. And so he'd always call me. And so the first thing he'd say, Hey, Willie, are you still sober? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm still sober. He said, and then he told me what was going on back home. And then, uh, then I said, I told him what I was up to. And I said, okay, well, try to, try to, try to keep, uh, keep well, he said to me. Oh, yeah, before you go, I said, I got some news for you. I said, your cousin Joe, he said, he stopped drinking. He stopped alcohol. And he, he, found, uh, he found Jesus Christ. He's a born-again Christian. And so he stopped drinking. He stopped doing drugs. And that was, that was the guy I pulled out of the darkness. When 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 we when I, when I left that dream, he was standing there waving at me, and uh, I I thought, oh okay, somebody's somebody's trying to help me here. Somebody's trying to show me something. Somebody's trying to give me hope, because at that time I, I I couldn't see no future for myself whatsoever, and I was seriously thinking about going back to those drugs, that alcohol, and those streets, and that gave me hope to, to keep keep me carrying on. Then I had dreams about my wife prior to her coming, and I had dreams about my children. So yeah, those, those things kept me going. So those are, are some of the dreams that that helped me along the way. Oh yeah, and Miguel, I do I did write a book. It's called I Have Lived Four Lives, and it's about my life story. And I, I actually I wrote three books. Two are star books, and the one is uh, about sort of semi autobiography. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, is from Isabel Sander. Hi, um, thank you so much for this talk. And uh, my question is just if you have a favorite constellation and maybe what the meaning is behind it. The favorite constellation, oh yeah. Yeah, I have a favorite con constellation. It's called Kugu uh, Managashi's Grandmother Spider. And Grandmother Spider sits in the Milky Way and uh, if you know the uh, stars of uh, Cassiopeia, the W in the sky, for uh, my people, th that W is part of a larger constellation called Kuku Managasis. Kuku Managasis translates as Grandmother Net Maker, better known as Grandmother Spider. So the W in the Cassiopeia, the inner points of the W is the head of the spider, and the two outer legs of the W are the front legs of the spider. And she's part of the uh, origin story of uh, 
how we come to this place with Tashki, this earth here. And you can find that in my book, you know. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my next question is from Carrie. Hi, uh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm a grade six um, teacher in Edmonton and part of our curriculum is um, the night sky for science. And so what I was wondering is, do you still do or would you still do your traveling planetarium? Um, or a Zoom meeting uh, or anything like that to share your knowledge with um, students? Is that something that you do or no? Yes, uh, always do that. We're uh, in, During this last couple of years pandemic, I've been doing nothing but Zooming. And in the last couple of months, since it started opening up, yeah, we've been taking the planetarium around. I mentioned that we were up in uh, Northern uh, Alberta and uh, I have a, uh, some inquiries from the Edmonton area of uh, various uh, teachers that are talking specifically about uh, bringing the planetarium. The thing about the planetarium is that uh, it's it's not cheap, and it would be it would be uh, advisable to get maybe two or three schools together to share okay. costs, and I could spend maybe a week up there, going from school to school, because uh, when I take the planetarium out, it it, it weighs uh, ninety one kilograms, and uh, I have to hire uh, two escopies, two helpers, to, for the driving and for the uh, for the setup and the takedown itself. Okay. Is there um, what would be the best way to sort of arrange either a Zoom meeting or the planetarium? Uh, get a hold of me. Uh, in your is there a place in the chat here I can uh, type? Oh yeah, right here. Here, here I'll type in my uh, my email. Uh, if you want, okay, good. Awesome. There's my email address. You can contact me with that. Then we, uh, if you're getting up uh, school school together, I can send you uh, cost estimates. And if you get enough schools together, then yeah, we'd be glad to go down there. And uh, I was uh, up there a couple of years. Well, before the pandemic, I was up there. I was at uh, Rocky Mountain House, and I was also at Enoch. Awesome. Okay. We, we're um, we're a new school that just opened, uh, Alex Jean Vier School. So uh, hopefully we will be able to coordinate with some other schools to get you. That would be fantastic. Get a hold of a lady named uh, Amanda Green. She's also a teacher. Okay. In, the, in your area, and she was asking ah. about. It. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Joanne. Um, thank you so much for your teachings. Um, it said that when you hear truth, you will recognize it. And I feel that in both of the talks, the Indigenous series talks, I've felt that very deeply that I'm hearing truth. So thank you for that. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, I was born on the prairies. And I feel a very strong tie to the earth here and the creatures here um, and this place. Uh, but my ancestors are from Great Britain, all of them. And I wonder, do our ancestors travel? Do they talk to us? Um, regardless of their, their place, their geographical places they come from? Well, one of the things our elders always say is that uh, and our energies attract, energy, like energies attract. And uh, yeah, we, we understand that uh, there's a ceremony that's done and some of those ceremonies, they say that uh, the, the medicine person can, uh, can actually uh, travel. I, I've, uh, I've been to some ceremonies where, where questions from overseas were answered, where uh, especially about uh, some of the elders during the Second World War, they were worried about their uh, their their uh, sons or daughters and how they were doing in uh, 
out in Europe and uh, they'd held ceremony and uh, the medicine man told them that they saw them and they were okay. So, so and, and they came back okay. So, yeah, so I guess those are some, some of the understandings. Thank you. Um, is there time? May I ask another question? Is there anybody waiting? Um, I, my other question, I have lots, but the second question I had in mind to ask you was how we come to knowledge through fasting. That is uh, very, of great interest to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so fasting is a process of uh, disconnecting yourself from the world. Leaving your iPhones behind, your, uh, your laptops, your televisions, your radios, your cars. Totally disconnecting from the, from the outside world and isolating yourself in a natural setting. And in that natural setting, all you got to do is you got to uh, dream and you got to pray and you got to sing and you got to sleep. That's what you do and think. And in that process, you're uh, decontaminating yourself from all the toxins because you're not, you're not eating and you're not drinking. For four days, you do that. And uh, so you, you disconnect and then you reconnect to the, the spiritual the energy of the natural world. And in those connections, dreams are made. And through all the process, all the experience that you had up to that point, there's connections made in, in, in your dreams as to what some of those things mean. Thank you. I think I need to plan a, plan a, plan a camping trip. <laughs> uh, is there anyone else that wants to ask any questions? So we have about five minutes left. Um, uh, there's a comment on the side uh, regarding your books from Michael Redhead Champagne, and that there's a link there where where your books can be bought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Also, there's a book called uh, Pichigizik, and it's the Great Sky. I have a. Uh, here. Since, since I've retired, my uh, my bedroom has become my office, so I got all kinds of stuff here. So, anyways, here's my new book. It's called Tichigizip, and uh, there's uh, 21 constellations in here, three constellations, and all the illustrations are done by my son, Mr. Wasis Buck. So, at the front of the book, there's a uh, Mistapeo. We call that one. And these are the stars of Orion, better known as stars of Orion. So one of the understandings in, in the, in the uh, indigenous astronomy, there are multiple tellings to any group of stars like uh, Orion. We've come across four understandings about uh, Orion, not just Orion being Orion. There's more to it than that. So there's multiple tellings to a lot of these uh, constellations. And with this, we have... These here are uh, poster sets. And these poster sets are based on the images of the book of Kichkizik. So this is the uh, winter thunderbird. And these are the stars of Draco and the stars of our Ursa Minor. And this is one of our main constellations in the sky. And there's, there's 21, 21 images in here about all the stars that are in reference in this book here. And we have them on sale, and you can get a hold of me if you are interested in getting copies of those. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Wilfred. And uh, the email for Wilfred is up there, uh, wilfred.buck at outlook.com if you want a copy of his books and his poster. I think we've come to the end of your talk. It has been very inspirational. I really en enjoyed it. And, um, and on behalf of the Faculty of Science, the University of Manitoba, I want to say thank you. And uh, thank you, Dean Mark, for the opening comments. And uh, uh, we're going to have our next uh, series again starting in, in uh, September because we're going to take a break during the summer. A lot of uh, people will go uh, do their research. So. so that's it on behalf of the university again. Thank you, Wilfred. Thank you.